Here we are again, folks. Back at reading the book, The Chronicles of Kara, book one. We are picking up where we left off before. The title of this chapter is He Had a Caustic Disposition. It's chapter number eight. George and I began to realize how John could work himself out of North Philadelphia into a tenure track professorship. He was the most dogmatic man I had ever seen. I have never been pushed so much in my life. Every morning at 3.30 he was there banging on the door to get us up to make it to meditation at 4, as if 4 wasn't bad enough. We would spend an hour exercising and then an hour in meditation. Next, we would go to the ship and see if we could channel energy into the hull. It was taking a lot of time. John was taking meticulous notes with every small incident as we were free associating, saying what we were thinking and feeling as we attempted to open the ship. This went on for almost two years. I began to wonder if people thought I was dead. One day it got to the point where I just had to say something. I guess old Rob was always the first one to run his mouth in a sensible way, of course. George had been complaining, but it had been complaining from the beginning. He was always complaining. He had a caustic disposition, to say the least. Since George was the official person who got us into this, my anger was directed at him. And it was right over a bowl of hot meal. It was over a bowl of hot oatmeal. At 6 a.m. I guess my face was all screwed up or something because he began to act a little weird. He finally narrowed his eyes at me. What? He exploded. I puckered my lips to speak before I said a word. He dropped the handle of his spoon onto the rim of the bowl. All right, all right. I know what you guys are going to say. He let out a long breath. John and I both looked and waited. I'm disappointed too. I didn't know it would take this long. I shook my head a bit. John just sat there quietly. All of that meditating must have been doing something for him. We can't talk that much right now, George said. We know it would take a long time, though. He looked at both of us, weighing his words. I don't know what's going on on the outside. They may even have told everyone that we were dead. He arched his brows and waited for an explosion which never came. John and I looked at each other and leaned back. I thought before speaking, knowing that almost everything we said was probably being recorded somewhere. As long as we're safe, I said. I don't want to end up if we can't get this thing working. Gone. George wiped his mouth with his hand. There's no reason for anything like that to happen to us. Uncle Sam's not that bad. Believe me. John looked at him askance. Of course Uncle Sam isn't. No, John, I'm serious. I've been involved in the service for who knows how long. He spread his hands. If Uncle Sam was that sick, there wouldn't be anybody to do anything. Jesus, he began to grin. I know you've heard stories, but I have connections, and so do you guys. Things will be fine. He tilted his head to the side slightly. We'll be heroes. He grinned so contagiously that I began to grin too. So did John. George looked down into his bowl of oatmeal and picked up the spoon slowly. It was still a bit too hot. He blew on it before speaking. How close, he asked in a hushed tone. Very. 
was all that John said. Another whole year passed. Chapter 9 About Buckle, worn like an amulet. Jesus, I felt great from all that exercising, meditating, and working out. All that we did was work on the ship, meditate, and do martial arts and practice flying. We ate like hell and worked it in the muscle. My little five-foot frame was as hard as iron. I looked great. The blue-eyed oppressor was ripped. So was George. He was just a couple more inches taller than me, with a ruddy complexion and red hair. He was a bit more stocky and muscular. John was about 5'11", strong and wiry by now, very flexible. Step by step, we had learned not only to operate this ship, but to also operate all of the little instruments that came with it. I remember it like it was only yesterday. It took a long time, but about six months later, we gained access to the cabin. John was the first one to enter, of course. He seemed to be able to meld with the ship better than the rest of us. John began to listen to what he called the inner voice. I guess he could hear it better than we could hear our inner voices. I can't speak for George, but I often tried to ignore any inner voices that I had. I thought of hearing voices as schizophrenia. When the small circle appeared on the ship again, and something that looked like a window at the top, John placed his hand there again, like we had done a thousand times. Instead of trying to project some type of thought that time, he didn't do that at all. His mind was completely still. I think I hear something, he said. I laughed to myself. George shook his head. What do you think you're hearing? Jorge asked. I think that I'm hearing instructions on how to get into this thing. He looked at us and waited for some wise cracks. After six months, we just wanted to get out of here. We didn't have any more. What are they saying? He asked. We've been doing it wrong. We've been trying to project our thoughts into this thing. The trick is to trust the subconscious to send the messages. What we need to do is to send subconscious messages. We have to let the subconscious act instead of trying to use the ego to control it. George scrunched up his face. You don't know what I'm talking about, he said to George. No. The problem is that I do. A bunch of hypnosis mumbo jumbo. I looked at George through squinted eyes. What do you believe in, George? Hypnosis has been scientifically proven centuries ago. He waved his hand. I haven't seen it. I shook my head. Can you say a bit more? Hori asked. It has to do with trusting the subconscious and the body. Whatever part of the mind that controls the involuntary parts of the body to connect with the ship. That makes the ship become an extension of the body. He bent his arm back and forth. When you bend an arm, you don't sit there concentrating on it to bend it. That only gets in the way. It's the same with the ship. I do, George said with a grin. I chuckled a bit. Jorge grinned. John just became a sourpuss. That made George smile more. He's joking, I said. John pursed his lips. In any event, John continued, that means that we have to do something more. We got to do more meditation work, moving meditation like Tai Chi and things like that. You think you can handle that, George? He just frowned. Good, John said. Now let's see how far we can go with this. He looked at Jorge. You have a notepad ready? Jorge gave a nod and held a pen to paper. John tried to move the ship. He tried to send a comment again. Nothing happened. Just can't seem to do it, he said. I stepped in. Let me try it. 
I've been doing Tai Chi and martial arts for years. They say the mind and body are supposed to become one. Maybe it will pay off after all. I placed my hand on the ship and the circle appeared below it. That was the easy part. By now all of us could do that quite easily. We noted that the circle would appear anywhere. About three or four inches above or below where we put our hand. I thought that I heard some type of inner voice and grinned. You hear the ship, don't you, John asked. I hear something. You hear the sucking sound of an empty mind, Jura said. I don't have your brain, I said angrily. John talked loudly, intercepting George's response. Do whatever it says, he said loudly. I listened again. I put my hand in a circle. I became silent inside, but allowed myself to imagine sending a command to the ship the way I would send a command to my arm doing Tai Chi. The small circle appeared on the side of the ship. It began to spiral to the left slowly and grow larger and larger. A ladder extended itself out and to the floor. I smiled. I knew that I had it. Jorge went to the ship first. John and George followed. I climbed the stairs and stood at the door looking in. I could tell that it was still connected. I was still connected with the ship as if it were part of my body. I could feel everyone walking inside and if I listened, if I listened, I could almost hear their thoughts. I became frightened. The ship trembled a little. John looked at me. You okay, Rob? I think that I'm still connected to this thing. It seems to be connected to me. I can sense that, John said. How about you, George? Believe it or not, if I listen to the small inner voice in my head, I can hear it too, in fact. I think that I can sense what some of you were thinking. I began to look around the ship. I thought of the implications of such technology. What would happen if the government got a hold of this technology? What would happen to the world? Several situations flashed through my mind when I looked at John, George, and Jorge. They were looking right at me. John and George quickly looked at Jorge. He scratched his chin. This is a powerful ship, a powerful experience, he said. I think I need to leave the exploration of this thing to you. I have some thoughts that I don't want shared. He looked at all of us. I'm sure that you do too. Good work, gentlemen. The keys to the ship are yours. Just let me know if you need anything. He walked out of the ship. We just stood there in silence for a few moments thinking. We all knew each other's thoughts instantly. We decided to stay in for a while to try to make sure that wouldn't happen all the time. In the meantime, George received a message from the ship. I didn't know why it was sent to him. All I knew is that he was listening to it for some reason. I could hear his thoughts, though. Not as something loud like before. I think that our will not to communicate with each other was being carried out. There's a hidden chamber somewhere near here, he said. He moved towards the front. He looked out of what appeared to be a window from inside. We had seen it before from the outside, but only a trace. From the inside, it seemed quite large and quite clear. There was a flight panel just below the windshield like the cockpit of a 747 except with very few buttons. I want to see the instruments, I thought. A small green image of the screen appeared over the flat console. I swept my hand through it. It was only a projection. I want weapons, I thought. A small drawer seems to appear out of the side of the panel on the left-hand side of the ship. It opened. There were several small objects four to be exact. They were about the size of a watch and round. They were tied to thick cords that looked like leather. George picked one up. 
He shook his head. You guys aren't going to believe what I'm hearing. These things are shields and weapons. You just point the glass side at an object, think, and it fires. I didn't hear any of that, I said. Neither did I, John said. What kind of shields are they? Impenetrable is what I'm hearing. Let me see one, I said. George handed it to me. You just think that you want your shield on and it appears. George nodded. Let me try then. I seem to be having a lot of luck with this ship. That's why you're going to be captain, John said. I don't know about that. You're drafted, George said. You've been doing that Tai Chi, so you're best for the job for now. Whatever, I said. Not really wanting to talk about it. Let me try this thing, I said. I held it in my hand and thought of wanting to be protected. I could feel something wrap completely around me. I couldn't hear a sound. I was totally cut off from everyone. I began to panic. I watched as John and George began to holler something. I couldn't hear it. Jorge rushed in. I watched all of the shouting and animation like a silent movie. The shield seemed to glow intensely as if it were getting stronger. Then I noticed there was no air. <laughs> I was suffocating. I really began to panic until I lost consciousness. When I awakened, John, George, and Jorge were standing there right over me. Jesus, Rob, George said. What are you trying to do, kill yourself? I dropped the little union. George bent over and picked it up. Be careful with that thing, George. It's dangerous. If you would have listened to me instead of panicking, you wouldn't have passed out, he said. I was trying to send a thought message to you. The ship said that this thing was an impenetrable unit, a protective shield. He looked down at it. Apparently, it can be strapped onto your belt, buckle, or worn like an amulet or strapped onto your wrist. Somehow, it converts sunlight to energy and then steps up the amount of output to near impenetrable. It works like a shield or a particle beam. You can point it at things and destroy them. Luckily, you didn't do that, he grinned. I didn't think any of it was funny. What happened was that you adjusted the thing to being impenetrable to just about anything, even oxygen. You almost killed yourself. You're lucky that you passed out and it went off. I didn't even do anything, I complained. I was nervous about something. I don't even know what it was. Then that thing just went up. And then it looked like it was getting stronger and stronger. This stuff is really dangerous. We're dealing with bioenergy, John said. That's why it was so easy to make it too dense. You got it to work, generated the field, and then you panicked because you couldn't get it to stop. That made it more dense, and it became a circular problem. You panicked more because you couldn't breathe, which made it even more dense. Finally, you passed out. And we were here to override your thoughts. George, anyway, he turned it off. Oh, you would have been dead. Dead as a stick. Then it would have turned off by itself. That would have been helpful. I said sarcastically. It's very important to be able to control yourself before using any of these little gadgets or flying ship, Jorge said. Not being in control... And in a meditative state can be disastrous. That's why I want these things kept on the ship. And I want you guys to spend as much time as you can in here. This stuff can really be dangerous. Especially in the wrong hands. And that's what I'm going to put in my report. We'll work at it, I said. I think we'll need to make this ship our quarters for a few months. Sleep in it. 
lay in it. Whatever, get drunk in it. I think that you can pass on that, Jorge said. But I like the bunk idea. He looked around. Something is different in here. I don't feel the way that I did before. We changed the settings on the ship somehow, John said. But apparently the ship has adjusted itself. They seem to send all of the messages about flying to Rob and about the weapons to George and overall navigation information to me. I guess we would have all had access to the information if we could just look in each other's minds. Since we can't, it has given us each a position. That's amazing. Quite amazing, Jorge said. The ship seems to even be more sophisticated than I thought. Almost unlimited power. That's the way I see it, we nodded. What do you think the government would do with a ship like this? He asked. Never mind. Don't tell me. The less I know the better. He stood up. I have to make my reports, he said. I think I need to get some paperwork done. I'll be around, though, if you need any help. Just keep me informed, okay? Are you sure that you don't want to be more involved? John took a step closer to him. He looked at John and thought for a moment. I'm involved as I need to be now. I don't need to know anything except for what you give me in the report. He looked at each of us. Do we understand each other? I gave him a nod. Yes, we do. We'll keep you informed. He smiled pleasantly. Very good. Living on the ship was strange, especially at night. Our dreams were so vivid that they seemed true to life. It seemed like the ship was downloading selective sections of its memories into each of us, and we in turn, during our dreams, were loading our consciousness into it. We began to just know things about the ship without even having to put the question out there. That was scary sometimes, but comforting at others. We seemed to be living in a different world. Sometimes it was difficult to tell fantasy from reality because it would take our hopes, dreams, and memories and play them back to us. They seemed all too real. The only thing that kept us sane was the visits from Jorge. He would bring us various food items, the type that we wanted, and new equipment to install into the ship. We would make it compatible with the ship following its instructions. We must have stayed in that ship, except for exercise breaks and walks for almost a year. While we were there, we discovered that there were safeguards on the ship and that it would help us just in case we made some type of error. But since the ship was alien, we didn't know how affected that would be. We wondered how far we could go without destroying ourselves before they kicked in. The ship and the instruments, after all, were not designed for human beings. Who knows what the inventors on this ship considered normal by way of gravity, the atmosphere, or atmospheric pressure. Even after more than a year of training and flying, we realized that flying this ship would be dangerous. Throughout the previous months, we had talked with psychologists and generals that had written reports reviewed by many scientists and military men. Everyone knew that we were in good health, excellent health, since all of the working out and meditation, we were ready to fly. The idea of flying it was frightening, not because we were going to fly it, 
but because we were going to take it. The fantasies and the daydreams had stopped months before liftoff, but our feeling about the needing to take the ship was so intense that we often wondered if it was some projection from the ship. Only the memory that we all had in common about the plan that we had all made the first day that we had arrived at Philadelphia Naval Yard reminded us that it was actually us thinking. So here we were, standing on the platform, along with the ship in Guantanamo Bay, alongside of all of the big brass from the Pentagon. The platform began to slowly rise to the surface as we climbed in. Helicopters and jet fighters circled to keep our space clear so that Russians couldn't see what was going on. We were supposed to take the ship up, circle around the field, and then land. At first, one of the big generals wanted to go with us after they heard some of the stories from us and Jorge, who had seen me almost suffocate. He had second thoughts. When they found that we could crash the thing if we got distracted or lost in a fantasy, as we called it, he decided to wait for the next flight, a longer, more glamorous one. Why endanger one's life for a loop around an airfield? We were happy that he didn't come. We had anything that we needed stocked and ready. We were going to carry out George's crazy plan to go to heaven knows where. We sat and waited. We saw what this ship could do and realized that any country that mastered this technology would go the way of the fascists and end up trying to conquer or control every other government in the world. And then they would probably go off into space trying to colonize it. We thought it would be better for the Earth if we returned the ship to wherever it came from. Sadly, that meant that none of us could ever return. We put on flight suits that resembled the ones that the Pentagon had. More like the Air Force. Phantom jet fighter suits. We had an oxygen set up on the ship and helmets even though we really didn't need them they were set up as just as a precaution i must admit that aunt uncle sam had been good to me we weren't working with a bunch of murders these people were really concerned about the safety of the united states and their families a lot of them really did join the service with the hope of keeping the peace. We also knew that the nature of army life dictated that one took orders from higher ups who were often totally disconnected to the common people. We decided that we wouldn't permit this thing to fall into the hands of those who would cause cosmic warfare and oppression, racism, sexism, rape, murder, prejudice, and organized theft unfortunately were the fruit of this civilization we would not permit them to export it to the cosmos we went in and strapped ourselves behind the console jorge came in and did some last minute checking he smiled brightly ready to go i gave the thumbs up sign i didn't want to talk that much because it would distract me. He understood what could happen from the earlier trials. Sometimes, after long in-depth conversations, we would be working various systems of the ship well, and then out of the blue, a thought would come up that pertained to the conversation and make it very difficult to finish our task. I cut my eyes over to Jorge. What do you think would happen if we had a fleet of these things? He tilted his head to the side thoughtfully. 
cut his eyes at me, and then walked out without speaking. The door sealed seamlessly behind him. We could feel the smooth hum of the ship as we slowly lifted off of the platform.